Majesty. Cal's bedded down for the night. Yeah. Oh, Hank, come over here a minute, would you? Sure. Something wrong? Yeah. Cal here seems to have hurt herself. It's like a barbed wire cut. Let's have a look. Yeah, you're right. It does look like barbed wire. There's no barbed wire where this animal's been. Oh, a wire like that on your property, Mr. Fuller, is over south the road. Yeah, that's right. This animal hasn't been in the south pastures for months. She's one of the animals I'm keeping up near the barn, grooming for the stock show next month. Yeah, I I know she is. You haven't let her get out accidentally, have you, Hank? Me? Well, I know, Mr. Fuller. You sure, Hank? Yes, sir. You said you want all the animals you brought in off the range kept inside the wooden fences. <laughs> You're the boss. I wouldn't let any of them near any barbed wire. It's mighty funny. Can't figure out no other way she could have hurt her leg like that. Me neither. Hey, pretty bad, too. Deep. Yeah, it is. I'll never be able to show her with a leg like this. Sure too bad, Mr. Fuller. She's a nice animal, too. Yeah, one of the best. I was counting on her boosting my score at the show. Say, you don't suppose McCard could have done it, do you? McCard? Sure. He's pretty hard hit for good show animals this year. Had to sell off quite a few to pay his mortgage and meet the taxes. I know, but McCarg's always been a good friend of mine. He wouldn't do a thing like that. Well, he might. He thought it might help him at the stock show. Needs that prize money pretty bad. But McCarg's a stock raiser from way back. He couldn't hurt a prize animal if he had to. Funny thing what some men will do for money, Mr. Ford. Look, Hank. I won't have you talking like that. Well, I was just saying that... McCarg's a good friend of mine. I've done him several favors lately. He wouldn't repay me by injuring one of my animals. Well, all I know is she couldn't have cut her leg like that around the corral. Looks to me like it was done purposely. Here, better clean out that cut and wrap it up. Yeah. Fetch me that disinfectant and some of those clean rags from the chest, Hank. Sure. Here's some right over here. Hmm? In the stall? Yeah, here on this shelf. What are they doing here? I, I don't know. This bottle's always kept in the chest at the end of the barn. Marsh, have you been treating this animal? No, I... I mean, uh, I didn't know she was hurt till you told me. Some other animal then? No, of course not. Didn't you inspect them all tonight? Yeah, I did. This is the only cow that's hurt. But what's this disinfectant and these clean rags doing here? Well, I... I just don't know, Mr. Fuller. I put that bottle away myself last week. I treated a horse. I haven't used it since. I haven't used it more than a month, I guess. Somebody did injure this animal, then tried to treat it here in its stall. He must have been frightened away before he could use the medicine. But who'd purposely cut its leg and then try to treat it? I don't know. No. Neither do I. Wait a minute. Huh? What's this? Look. Look here. What? It's a short length of barbed wire. With blood on it. I Ned, you're right. It was hidden under the straw. I just happened to pick it up with my foot. Must have been in that last load of straw we brought in. She must have laid down on it and cut her leg. No, not that deep. Hank, there's been dirty work around here. Here, hold these rags. Fix up this leg. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Easy now, girl. Yeah, just take it easy. You better stand back, Hank. She's about to get a little excited when... Hank. What's the idea? Don't move, Mr. Fella. That gun. Put it away, Hank. Not on your life. Lucky for me, your foot didn't kick it up from the straw, too. You. You did this. I don't deny it. Yes, I injured the animal. I hid the barbed wire beneath the straw and this gun, too, to make it handy. Hank. And I put the disinfectant here in the stall so you'd work on the cut. And I'd have you right here where I want you. Hank, why? 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 You mean you don't know? 
I certainly don't. Because you won't give Martha what she wants. Martha? Your wife, Mrs. Fuller. Well, give her what she wants. Divorce. Divorce? Ah, oh, stop your pretending. Why, she's never asked me for a divorce. She has a dozen times. What makes you think so? She told me. Told you. I told you to stop pretending. You know she wants to marry me. What? Don't act so amazed. <laughs> I am amazed. I'm glad to know about this. You've known about it for a long time. And I assure you that I haven't. It's no good acting that way, Mr. Fuller. You've had a lot of fun, haven't you? Letting me go on like this, working for you for peanuts, calling you Mr., doing all your dirty work around the farm. You've been well paid. I've never asked you to do anything that I wouldn't do myself. Well, I'm putting an end to all of it right now. Hank, give me that gun. Not on your life. You can't shoot me in cold blood. They'll get you. Not me. They'll never know. When they find me with a bullet in me, Hank... They'll never find a bullet in you. They'll never bother to look for one. Don't you remember this cow? Take a good look at her. You remember last fall when McCard's shotgun accidentally went off near her? How she almost trampled him to death? Hank, no. One shot, fella, through your heart. By the time that animal's hoofs have done their work... No, Marsh, no. They'll never recognize you when they pull you out of a stall. You can't do that. They'll never bother to look for a bullet. Listen to me, Hank. They'll think your gun went off accidentally and the animal trampled you to death. Give me that gun, Hank. And the farm will be Martha's and mine. Give it to me, Hank. Keep back. Give it to me. Keep back, I say. Take this. Oh! Ah! My eyes. You blinded me. Take it easy, you yellow pup. Your eyes will be all right. Water. Water, get me some water. My eyes are stinging. They'll be all right. Come on with me. I can't see. Here, this way. What are you going to do? I'm going to take you to the well and bathe your eyes. You're, you're not going to kill me. Careful. Here's the barn door. I, I didn't know what I was doing, Mr. Fuller. Easy now. I, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't want to kill you. You only missed killing me by a hair's breadth. Oh, I was out of my head. Oh, my eyes. We'll talk about that later. Where are we? Where are you taking me? Over to the well. Mr. Fuller, what in the name of heaven are you going to do to me? I'm going to wash out your eyes. Come on now. Yes, water. Easy now. No, don't rub them. Keep your hands away from your filthy face. But I can't stand this pain. You'll be all right in a minute. I can't stand it. I tell you, I can't stand it. Marsh. Let go of me. You're taking me off to leave me someplace to die. Stop it. Stop it. Now you're trying to kill me. No, I'm not trying to kill you. You are. I know you are. Don't be a fool. I'm blind. Sure. Sure, this is your chance. Chance to get rid of me. Why, well, you're not going to do it. Hank, for the love of heaven, listen to no. me. No! I'm only taking you to the well. Throw me in, huh? You want to throw me in? I want to wash out those eyes. No! You don't care about me. All you want is a chance to do away with me. No, you rat. I'm only trying to help you. Let go, let go my arm. Let go my arm. I no, can't. you're staying with me. I won't do it. I won't be led like an animal to the slaughter. Let go of me. Stop it. Let go of my arm. We're almost to the well now. No! Oh! Oh! My eyes. Well, water will fix them up. I'm not going near that well. That disinfectant will burn those eye tissues if you don't get it washed out of them. I won't. You're going to throw me in. I won't go near that well. Hank. I go. I won't go near it. I won't go near it. Hey, no! Oh! Oh! I... Now. Oh. Get up on your feet. Come over to the well and get your eyes washed out. Oh. Now keep your head. Oh, my eyes. Here now. You bend over this water trough. Come on, bend lower. Mr. Fuller. Come on now. Get oh. plenty of this cold water into your eyes. That's like it. Oh. A little more. Here, use this cloth. Soak it with water. Yeah. All right. Yeah. 
Lucky that was just a mild disinfectant. Won't bother you any. I'll put that up to your eyes. That's it. Now, you open your eyes? I don't know. Well, try. Yeah. Feel better? Uh-huh. Burn's easing up. Yeah, let's see him. Yeah. They're just inflamed a little. I'll be all right. I go into the house and bathe him in warm water now. You... You didn't have to help me. Skip it. Come on. Wait a minute. What's that noise? The New York plane. What's she so low for? I don't know. She's too low. What's wrong with her? Good Lord. She's on fire. On fire? Yes. A mass of flames. What a... Falling. Stephen. Falling. Stephen. Falling. Wake up. Falling. She exploded in midair. Now she's falling. Stephen. <laughs> Martha. Oh, heaven, Stephen, you've been having a nightmare. I've been asleep. You were screaming at the top of your lungs about something falling. The plane. Plane? The night plane to New York. What about it? She was low. Too low. She was in flames. Exploded in midair. Oh, you were dreaming. The plane did go over just as you began to scream in your sleep. Oh, well, let's see the clock. Yes. She goes over at the same time each night. And she was extra low tonight. The motors were awfully loud. Close. Yes. But there was no explosion. A dream. Yet so real. Oh, you'd better go back to sleep, dear. But that wasn't all of the dream. Oh, you can tell me all about it in the morning, oh, dear. Oh, that wasn't all. Stephen. Where are you going? To Hank's room. Why? No, where's that other slipper? Yeah. Here. Stephen, what's wrong, dear? That's what I want to know. Stephen! Hank! Hank, open up! Hank! He's not in here. The bed's not slept in. Stephen, what in the world's wrong with you? Hank's gone. Gone? He hadn't been in his bed. No. Did he tell you he was going anyplace? No. That dream. It couldn't be true. Was it... Was it about him? Yeah. About him. We were together in the prize stock barn, bedding down the animals. One of the prize cows had cut her leg. We couldn't understand it because she hadn't been near any of the pastures with barbed wire. I was bringing Hank up here to bathe his eyes. Just as the plane was flying over. She was too low. And she caught fire. There was that awful explosion. Oh, but it was all a dream. Come on, we'll see. Stephen. I'm going out to the barn. Come along if you wish. Something tells me that it was more than just a dream. <laughs> Foolish. I, I tell you, it was just a dream. Here. Do you hold this lantern? Oh, but you need your sleep, dear. Get this door. I'll take it now. All right. Come on. Uh, here's the stall. You bring the flashlight? Here. Here, take the lantern. Tom found it. What's wrong? The battery burned out? Stephen. They're on her leg. A deep cut. Fresh cut. It needs attention. Martha. It's identical to the injury in my dream. Oh, Stephen, surely. It is, Martha. Oh, she just cut herself yesterday and you didn't know. No. Oh. I always examine the prize stock in their stalls every night. Martha, this animal was in perfect condition when we went to bed. Oh, but Stephen. Wait a minute. What in the world are you doing? I'm looking through this stall, but. By heavens, look! A short length of barbed wire. 
bloody barbed wire. Stephen. Just like the dream. The very same. There should be something else. Yes, here. Look. A gun. Hidden here in the straw. Here where he put it. Who? Hank Marsh, of course. Who else? Oh, no, Stephen. Yes. And look. There, on the top of the feed box. The bottle of disinfectant. Some clean rags. Oh, but Stephen, you... Just like the dream. Every bit of it is just like the dream. But you couldn't have dreamed all that. A hidden barbed wire. The cut on the cow's leg. The hidden gun. The medicine. All the same. Stephen. And this cow... She's the one that almost trampled McHarg to death last fall when his shotgun accidentally went off. But surely you don't think Henry Marsh planned to kill you. Yes, he planned it. Worked it out carefully. Very carefully. But now his plan's no good because of that dream. No, Stephen, he couldn't have. Yes. And in my dream, I saw how it was all going to work out. It was shown how I could save myself by throwing the disinfectant into his eyes. I tell you, there's some other explanation. Then a plane. It did fly over low tonight, you said? Yes. And it must have caught on fire. It must have exploded. But it couldn't have. I didn't hear a thing except the motors. You heard me screaming about it in my dream. Yes, but you... Well, you must have been so intent upon what I was saying that you didn't hear the noise of the explosion. Oh, no, that's impossible. It was over south of the road. Here, give me that lantern. Stephen, you... You go back to the house. I'm going to look for that wreckage. Stephen? Not a sign of anything out there in the field. I called the airport. They checked the plane. It passed over Sheldon some time ago. That's miles from here toward New York. Safe? Yes. There couldn't be a mistake? No. The plane that passed over here while you were dreaming is almost in New York now. I can't understand it. All the rest of the dream was true. All but the part about the plane. No, just a dream. The other things... The injury to the cow, the wire, the gun. Didn't you say you lost your gun several months ago? Yes, yes, I did. Well, you must have dropped it in the straw when you stored it in the barn. It and the wire were thrown into the cow's stall purely by accident. But the injury... Stephen, both of us know how easily and mysteriously cows can injure their legs. And the disinfectant. Oh, you simply left it in there in the stall and forgot about it. No, I couldn't have... going to open it, Stephen? It's unlocked. Come in. Hank. Golly. Golly, I'm glad you're up, Mr. Fuller. Henry. It's late. You, you haven't been in your bed tonight. I forgot to tell you I was going to town. Now, Mr. Fuller, well, that cow in stall 13, she's cut her leg. Henry, I... Well, I just happened to look at it. Looked in, found the barn door open, and... Why? What's the matter, Mr. Fuller? Then why do you look at me like that? Stephen! You want me to come out to the barn, Hank? Why? Why, yes. That cow's leg's pretty bad. A barbed wire cut? You... You know about it? And isn't the wire lying beneath the straw of the stall right now? Mr. Fuller, I... And isn't this the gun you hid under the straw? How'd you find that? Oh, Stephen. So, it is true. You plan to kill me. No. Plan for the animal to trample me and mutilate me. No, no, no. Plan to marry Martha and get my farm. Oh, no, Stephen, no, you're wrong. No, I'm not wrong. You planned it together. Only my dreams spoiled your plans. Well, now you can be together. Stephen, no. Put that gun down. Well, I'm going to send you. You can burn together. No, Stephen, no, no, no. Heaven for New York. 
York, now leaving at gate two, all passengers for New York, flight seven, all aboard at gate two, all aboard at gate two, flight seven, now leaving for New York, all aboard at gate two. All clear. All right, shut the door. Found it. Five minutes late taking off. Why don't they get this thing into the air? I've been hiding all day, waiting for darkness. Waiting here to take this plane to New York. <laughs> New York. They won't find me there. <laughs> no. They're not going to find me there. I've been waiting. Been waiting. Huh. Good. Taking off. Yeah. I'll be in New York soon. You can unfasten your safety belt now, Mr. Fuller. Huh? You know me? Yes. We always have a list of all the passengers. Let's see. Um, you're going to New York. Huh. New York? Yeah, yeah. Taking a little weekend trip. Just up and left the farm for a weekend. Decided I needed a vacation. Vacations are good for a person. Yeah. I decided I needed a little rest. So here I am. <laughs> Funny thing. I dreamed about this plane last night. Yeah. She always passes over my farm about midnight. Dream last night that she was flying exceptionally low. <laughs> Funny, too, because she generally gained uh, quite a bit of altitude by the time she gets over my place. <sighs> it was a queer dream. Thought I was standing out back of my house, and she went over just a a little before the barn tops, and then she caught on fire and exploded. Exploded right there in midair, right over my farm. <laughs> uh, I guess we all have funny dreams sometimes. Uh, this one was sure real. But look, there's my farm down there now. See? Had a red light put on my windmill so it could be seen at night. And look how close it seemed. How close? Too close. We're flying too low. I said we're flying too low. Look, just above the barn tops, just like the dream. Just like the dream. No, it can't be that. Look out the window. Flames. What if the motor's on fire? What if the motor's on fire? We're flying too low. <laughs> You have heard The Edge of the Shadow, tonight's original tale of dark fantasy by Scott Bishop, originating in the studios of WKY. Ben Morris was heard as Stephen Fuller, Eleanor Corrin was Martha Fuller, Muir Height played Hank Marsh, and Georgiana Cook was the stewardess. Next Friday at this time, listen to the 22nd in this series of dark fantasy adventures created for you by Scott Bishop, a weird and pulse-pounding tale of terror. Harare, which relates how an angered witch doctor of the Ecuador jungle brews a bitter, deadly poison to use against a strange and heartless enemy. This program came to you from Oklahoma City. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Like seaweed, long and wet. Not since I got acquainted with these blue blades by Gillette. 
I've outlawed whiskers in my court. Behold, my crew shave slick. No other play can whisk them off. So extra smooth and quick. Who look sharp? Every time you shave, who feel sharp? And be on the ball. Just be sharp. Use the left blue blade for the quickest lick that shaves far off. Hey folks, Waddle from Watch Waddle here. Hope you're enjoying today's radio program. And if you're considering getting a new radio to listen to them, why not get one with the newest innovation? The 4-Speed Record Player. Because available now is our newest hits from Watch Waddle Production. Check out me and the gang in our hilarious, zany, and crazy tunes filled with spoofs, gags, and jokes. Available in our playlist collection. Check them out for some cheap laughs and running gags. Well, uh, well, and when we say running gags, we ain't kidding, brother. <laughs> Screwy Forests Watch Waddle Cartoons. <laughs> Available on Channel Watch Waddle. Speaking from London. Here in the grim stone structure on the Thames, which houses Scotland Yard, is a warehouse full of souvenirs, where everyday objects, a skipping rope, a glass, an iron, a stepladder, all are touched by murder. Now you take this key. This was on the floor beside the body, sir. A door key. The kind that fits only one lock. But whose? Perhaps the murderer, sir. Today, this key can be seen in the Black Museum. From the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. In just a moment, you will hear The Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. <laughs> Starring Orson Welles. Well, here we are in the Black Museum, Scotland Yard's Museum of Murder. Here lies death, arranged neatly on the shelves and tables open to your view. Now, here's a spoon. It's a simple household spoon. Our murderer was meticulous. With this, he measured out a careful dose of poison. That oar up there on the wall, 
That was used by the stroke of a famous rowing aid at Henley. Later it was used in anger, swung at a man who stood on the edge of a pier, stunning him. The man drowned in the Thames very quickly. Ah, here we are. Here's the key. An ordinary key. The kind used to open most of the front doors in London. Once this key was in the pocket of a man who was waiting for another in his room at the Kingsley Arms Hotel in Surrey. Regan? Oh, I... I'm sorry. Excuse me, sir. I'll, I'll just turn the bed down. Uh, certainly. I'm waiting for Mr. Regan. You don't happen to know what time he'll be back, do you? No, sir, but if you wait here, you're sure to catch him. Thanks, I will. I particularly want to see him. The conversation lapsed. The visitor sat down again. The maid completed her work and left, stealing a glance at the young man as she closed the door behind her. Night fell. Lights came on in the guest bedrooms. But in one room, the number on the door was 22. A man sat alone in the darkness, waiting. The night passed, and morning came. In the hotel, there were beds to be made, rooms to tidy. No answer from room 22. The maid was pleased her work could be accomplished without interruption. She was thinking of this as she opened the door. Stepped in, the bed was unused, turned down just as she'd left it. Sunlight was flooding through the two windows, and on the floor, a man lay dead. <laughs> the manager called the police. The police requested the assistance of Scotland Yard. And Inspector Sidney Russell and Detective Sergeant Hobbs were sent down to Surrey. This is the room, sir. Number 22. Has anyone been in there since the maid found the body? No one, Inspector, except myself and the local police sergeant. On his orders, I kept the room locked. Good, ma'am. There you are. Thank you. I'll let you know when we need you, sir. The two detectives covered the room, and in their quick survey of the murder scene, they found several leads. His wallet, sir. Let's have a look at the identity card, Sergeant. There you are, sir. Hmm. Name's Thomas Regan. What else have you got there, Sergeant? Uh, roll a note, sir. The killer either missed that or the motive wasn't robbery. Oh, I don't think it was robbery, sir. His watch is still on his wrist. Going? No, sir. It stopped at 7.25. That might have been the time the murder took place, though on the other hand, the watch might have run down this morning. He was shot through the head, sir. Surely somebody must have heard that. You would think so. Well, here's a shell I found on the carpet. Hmm. Point 22. We'll keep this for ballistics. What else, Sergeant? Oh, some silver taken from his trouser pocket, a handkerchief with the initials, initials T.R. in the corner, and a cigarette lighter. With the initials T.R. Hmm. He's well labelled. And uh, this was on the floor beside the body, sir. The door key, the kind that fits only one lock. But whose? Perhaps the murderer, sir? Unless it belonged to Regan himself. Oh, it's not the kind they use in hotels. No. Was he wearing or carrying a keychain? No, sir. Then the key would have been carried in his pocket along with his money. Which hadn't been spilled onto the floor. You may be right, Sergeant, but to make absolutely sure, that key should be checked against every lock in Regan's home and his office and everywhere he might have occasion to visit. If it does not belong in any of those places, then it seems to me that when we find the door that key fits, we find the murderer. The detectives went downstairs to talk once more to the hotel manager. Inspector, this is a terrible business. Listen to those men in the bar. What about them, sir? They're newspaper reporters. Oh, this is really dreadful. The notoriety, the reporters, the headlines. It'll ruin my business. It wasn't very nice for Mr. Regan, either. No, I, I suppose not, poor devil. What can you tell us about him? Only that he was a commercial traveller. He stayed here before? Oh, several times. A traveller, eh? Did he work for any firm in particular, would you happen to know? Yes, I do know, because they always paid the hotel bills. He worked for a London firm, Hardy and Sons Limited. Thank you, sir. Now, I'll leave the room upstairs locked until we have it photographed and checked for fingerprints. Oh, Inspector, there's one other thing I'd better mention. I think it's important. Yes? A man called to see Mr. Regan last night. Did you get a good look at him? I didn't see him at all, nor did the desk clerk. The maid found him waiting in room 22 when she came in to turn the bed down. Unusual, isn't it? Knowing Regan's room number? 
It suggests an acquaintance. Not necessarily, Inspector. Why do you say that? We have a register here in the foyer. It's on that wall over there. A room register? Yes, just a card opposite the room number. Some people don't bother with it, but Mr. Regan always put his card up. So that made us the only one who saw this man? Yes, Inspector. Then I'd like to talk to her, sir. Oh, I'll go and get her for you. The hotel manager returned almost immediately with the maid. She was a young girl, very pale, her eyes still fearful from the sight she'd seen on the floor of room 22. Annie Mitchell, Inspector. How do you do, Annie? Uh, this is Inspector Russell from Scotland Yard. How do you do, sir? Annie, what time did you turn down the bed in room 22 last night? It was going on for six, sir. And I believe Mr. Regan was not in his room. No, sir, but there was a man there. Could you describe him to me? Well... He was tall, fairly young-looking, and dark hair. He spoke uh, educated-like. I see. What did he say? Just that he was waiting for Mr. Regan, and he particularly wanted to see him. Tell me, would you know this man if you saw him again? Yes, I think I would. The inspector was well satisfied, but Sergeant Hobbs, who had been questioning the guests, had not fared so well. Uh, now, sir, I'm sorry to trouble you, but I have to ask you a few questions. Uh, really, this is most annoying. I've been kept here all the morning, and it's extremely inconvenient. I quite understand, sir. Now, uh, can you tell me whether you heard any unusual noise or disturbance during the night? The only disturbance of which I'm aware is the disturbance created by the police this morning. You uh, didn't hear a shot, for instance? Certainly not. And you were in your room the whole evening? Yes. Can I go now? Yes, that'll be all. Uh, thank you very much. Well, it's certainly not been a pleasure. It seems nobody heard a shot last night, sir. Nobody at all. Not a single guest, even those occupying adjoining rooms. That's funny. Anyway, I'm leaving you in charge here. The police right, surgeon sir. will be arriving to carry out a post-mortem. All right, sir. Are you going back to London? Yes, I think the case winds up there. The next move is to London to check that key against every lock in Mr. Regan's home and his office just to see if it fits. <laughs> I'm uh, very sorry to bother you, ma'am, but I'd like to go right over the house, if you don't mind, trying the locks, and uh, if there are any cases or cupboards, etc., that I might miss, I'd be very pleased if you'd point them out to me. I've uh, come along to see if you can help me, sir, in connection with Mr. Regan. I want to know if there's any desk or a cupboard in his office or the office door itself, which has a lock for which this might be the key. I believe you've a, a lock-up garage here, formerly rented by Mr. Regan. It must, of course, have a lock, and I'll be glad if you'd allow me to compare the lock with this. No, sir. I've checked every conceivable place connected with Regan, and the answer's the same everywhere. The key does not belong. Mm -hmm. In that case, we have our answer. Somewhere, someplace, Sergeant, there is a door, and behind that door we'll find the murderer. You know, if I was a philosopher, I would say that it's rather symbolic that we have a key to which we must fit the lock. Still, I'm not a philosopher, I'm a detective, and it's our job, Sergeant to find the lock, to find the door, and to find the murderer. And that's just what we're going to do, Sergeant. We're going to find the door that this key fits. In time, they were to find the door. By patient, methodical methods, they came to the front door of a small flat. The key fitted. The same key that can be seen today in the Black Museum. <laughs> In just a moment, we will continue with The Black Museum, starring Orson Welles.
And now we continue with The Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. Inspector Russell went back to London, certain that the crime had motive and that the motive would only be found by a search into the habits and associations of Thomas Regan. His first call was to the offices of Hardy and Sons Limited where he was speedily ushered into the presence of the reigning Mr. Hardy. Come in, Inspector. Sit down. Thank you, sir. Shocking business. Now, who could have wanted to kill poor Regan? That's what we're trying to find out. Of course. Shocking. One of our best travelers. What do you know of his personal life, Mr. Hardy? I may be able to help you there, Inspector. I believe in taking an interest in my employees. I've uh, always encouraged them to bring their troubles to me. And Regan had troubles? Yes. He was a bachelor. Rather a gay one at times. I suspect he, uh, he was having trouble over a woman. Yes? A married woman. She kept on ringing up to speak to him, and the thing spread in the office. He was rather embarrassed and slightly worried about it all. Do you happen to know the woman's name, Mr. Hardy? I'm afraid I can't help you there, Inspector, though, uh... Wait a minute. Yes? He did mention something. That's right. I've got it now. Uh, he didn't want to tell me her name. Well, that's a pity. But in admitting she was married, he did tell me that her husband was a doctor on hospital duty. A doctor? Yes, and uh, one other thing I recollect. He mentioned her first name. It was Lindell. And I have information that the man we want to interview is young. That suggests a hospital in turn. Yes, with a wife named Lindell. Hmm. Not very much to go on, Inspector. Well, it might be quite a help. He never told you, I suppose, whether it was a London hospital or not? He never said so, but I'm quite sure it would be. At least the wife lives in London. What makes you think that? Well, the number of telephone calls that woman made to Regan. Nobody could afford that many trunk line calls. So they began in London. St. Bartholomew's Hospital. An intern or a young doctor whose wife's name is Lindell. The registrars of the big hospitals consulted their records, made special inquiries. St. Thomas's, Westminster, Guy's. Each one of them returned to shake his head. There are several hundred hospitals in the London area. Big general hospitals, small private nursing homes, special hospitals, children's hospitals, maternity infectious orthopedic hospitals. At the first 42, they drew a blank. Then, at the London Royal Hospital at last. A young intern whose wife's name's Lindell. That's a funny one, Inspector. It's all the information we have, Doctor. It's useless to ask, I suppose, whether you might have this man on your staff. But we do have him. What? Well, at any rate, one of our interns has a wife named Lindell, Dr. Bowen. Dr. Felix Bowen. I'll send for him, shall I? No, wait, Doctor. Could you give me some idea what this Dr. Byrne looks like? Yes, I think so. He's, he's young, 31, I, I think. Uh, quite tall, uh, dark hair. Would you have his address here in your records, Doctor? Certainly. I'll, I'll get it for you, Inspector. Thank you. And shall I send for Dr. Byrne? No, I don't want to see him just now. And I don't want it known that any queries have been made about him. Uh, very well, you can depend on me. Is he in some kind of trouble? Nothing to worry about just yet, sir. Now, if you'll get me that address... Patients had paid off, the 43rd Hospital. Now, to interview Lindell Bowen. Inspector Russell went to the address he'd been given a small flat in a good residential district. The lock on the door fascinated him. The urge to try out the key in his pocket was almost overwhelming. But instead, he knocked. Mrs. Bowen? Yes? I'm Inspector Russell from Scotland Yard. Scotland Yard. May I come in? Yes, of course. Thank you. She was young, an attractive woman, but her eyes were frightened. Mrs. Byrne, when did you last see Thomas Regan? Regan? Tom Thomas Regan? I think you know who I mean. But I don't, Inspector. I'm very sorry. Not at all, ma'am. Perhaps I'm mistaken. Well, of course, I've read about him in the papers. That is, if it's the same, Mr. Regan. It is the same. Mrs. Byrne, 
With your permission, I'd like to conduct a small experiment. Experiment? I, I don't understand, Inspector. It's quite simple. This key. Key? I'd like to try it in your front door. But I... Of course, if you choose to say no, then I won't be able to try it. You won't? But, but I, I also ought to warn you that I can return in a very short time with a warrant. All right. Try it. Thank you, Mrs. Byrne. I'll just open the door and insert the key. <gasps> the key turned effortlessly and easily. Hope died in the woman's eyes. The inspector from the yard took out the key and closed the door again. And now, Mrs. Byrne, you and I are going to have a talk about Thomas Regan. That afternoon, several significant events took place. A gun was found beneath a pile of medical books. It was taken to Scotland Yard to the ballistics expert there. The gun checks up. That's a murder weapon right enough. Little wonder nobody heard the shot in the hotel. It's fitted with a silencer. A silencer. Evidence of premeditation. Late that afternoon, the record of its purchase was uncovered. The second significant event. The gun was bought at a shop in the Soho district, sir. A second-hand shop two weeks ago. By whom, Sergeant? The description covers Dr. Felix Bowen. And the proprietor says he could recognize the man if he saw him again. We'll give him that chance. Come on. Where to, sir? The hospital. To pick up Bowen. The third event was Bowen's flight across London. Somehow, in some way, the doctor learned of the net that was closing about him and made a run for it. He was gone when the detectives reached the London Royal Hospital. They drove to his home, but he wasn't there. Now across England, the vast network of police communications went into action. The teletype carried the news of the fugitive. Central to all stations. General alarm for one Dr. Felix Byrne, aged about 31, six feet tall, dark hair. Educated voice, quietly spoken. Wanted on suspicion of murder. The search was on. In a thousand stations, vigilant eyes searched for Bowen. On the streets, on trains and buses, in restaurants and hotels. Within 24 hours, he was picked up. I, I really must insist. This is a terrible mistake. I really don't know what, what this is about. Uh, and I'm sure you've got nothing to worry about, sir. Uh, just answer a few questions, that's all. Well, of course, I'm perfectly prepared to cooperate with the law. But I must insist on an explanation at once. Yes, yes, of course, sir. You see, unfortunately, your appearance coincides with the description of a man wanted by the police. It's oh? uh, just a routine matter, sir. Uh, if you'll give me some proof of your identity, we can clear the matter up in a few minutes. But I explained to the constable. It, it's no longer compulsory to carry an identity card. Yes, I know that, sir. But before we release you, we must have proof of your identity. Yes, but how can I... Uh, you see, sir, we must be sure you're not the wanted man. But I told you already... Uh, now, Mr. Bowen. Yes? Yes. Dr. Bowen. Inspector Russell? This is Sergeant Thompson, sir. Hi, it. We've picked up a man who we believe is Dr. Felix Bowen. Hold him, Thompson. I'll be there in a matter of minutes. It was Bowen right enough. But if Inspector Russell hoped for an easy confession, he was disappointed. The doctor was defiant and tight-lipped. I know nothing, I tell you. Nothing whatever. This whole thing is an outrage. I must remind you, sir, that your wife has made certain admissions. My wife? What has she told you? That she and Regan were having a love affair. That you found out. And the day before last, you went down to Surrey to see Regan. You returned late that night. Did I? And under a pile of medical books in your bookcase, we found the gun you used. The game's up, Bowen. The game is never up, Inspector. Until it's lost. The evidence they had accumulated was impressive. But juries are cautious, and defense counsels are often very smart. There had to be no loopholes. There had to be complete corroborating evidence. 
I think we've got our man all right. The next thing is to prove it beyond all shadow of doubt. What's the uh, next move then, sir? Well, Sergeant, there's one person who got more than a passing glimpse of the murderer. Oh, you mean Annie, the maid at the hotel. Right. We'll see how Mr. Byrne fares on an identification parade. I have a feeling he won't fare too well. Now, Annie, I expect you've heard of an identification parade. Yes, sir. Like they have on the films. That's right, Annie, but this is not a film. This is the real thing. Before we go into the next room, I want to impress on you how important it is that you make no mistake. A man's life may depend on your judgment. So when you answer me, make sure, absolutely sure, beyond any shadow of doubt, the man you identify is the man you saw on the night of the murder. Yes, sir. Right, then. Now, in the next room, there are eight men. I want you to follow me into the room, take a good look at each of them, and see if you can pick out from amongst them the man you saw in room 22 waiting for Mr. Regan. Very well, sir. It's not the first gentleman. Nor the second. But... This is the man, sir. That's a lie. Yes, and that's his voice. I'd know it anywhere. This is the man, Inspector. Well, Mr. Byrne, would you like to make a statement to us now? I have nothing to say, except that I doubt that the evidence of a silly maid is likely to give you a conviction, Inspector, whatever you may think. We're depending on more than that, Mr. Byrne. There are other witnesses, including a silent witness, a door key. That was careless of you, Mr. Byrne. Very careless indeed. Byrne was identified also by the owner of the second-hand shop as being the man who had bought the gun some two weeks before. With that, the case was complete. A door key had helped to find a murderer. And that self-same key can be seen today in the Black Museum. Orson Welles will be back with you in just a moment. Now here in person is Orson Welles. Bowen killed the man who had stolen the affections of his wife. His was not a clever crime. It was premeditated, without a doubt, but clumsily conceived. For the young doctor was no student of the art of murder. Yet he might have escaped justice had not a key fallen from his pocket. A key which ultimately brought the police to his front door. And now, until we meet next time in the same place, and I tell you another story about the Black Museum... I remain, as always, obediently yours. The Black Museum, starring Austin Wells, is presented by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer Radio Attractions. The program is written by Creswick Jenkinson, with music composed and conducted by Sidney Torch. Produced by Harry Allen Towers.
My dog's faster than your dog. My dog's bigger than yours. My dog's better because he gets kennel ration. My dog's better than yours. Kennel ration. The lean red meat he wants, the other good things he needs. Juicy, tender, and moist. My dog's prettier, smarter, taller. My dog's better than yours. Kennel ration. Lucky beer, premium beer, lucky premium beer, so lively, get lucky, cling to exciting beer flavor. Finest ingredients, aged for flavor, that's Lucky Lager, flavor that's entertaining, enthusiastic, a very exciting beer. Lucky beer, premium beer, lucky premium beer. Howdy, stranger. Howdy, mister. Mind if I come in and sit a while? Nope, reckon I don't. Gets sort of dad blame lonesome along this highway. Uh, much obliged. Uh, my feet wouldn't hold up another mile. Are you hitching? Yep. Uh, going fur? Don't know. Uh, you come fur? Yep. Come around, smart piece. Hmm, getting pretty old to be hitchhiking. Get many rides? Yep. Had anything to eat lately? Not much. Coffee smells good. Mm, it is good. Make it myself. How about a cup? Warm you up. All right. Matter of fact, I'll have one with you. Got any manse bread? Any what? Manse bread. Never heard of it. No. I forgot. Reckon you never have. Here you are, mister. Nice and hot. How much? Oh, just a nickel. Well, what a nickel is, but take it out of that. What's obliged? Hey, hold on. This ain't no nickel. What's that, mister? I say this ain't no nickel. It's a gold coin. Hey, don't you know it's against the law to have gold in your possession these days? In what law? Why, well... Well, we went off the gold standard years ago. Everybody turned in their gold. Well, they turned into the government. And, well, they got silver in exchange. I see. And you best return my coin. Well, this coin is old, ain't it, stranger? Somewhat. Yeah, old. Got the head of the King of England on it. Can't see the date very well. See... 1700 yeah, and something. Take this coin instead. I gave you the gold run by mistake. Well, brother, I make no mistake when I give it back to you. To my way of thinking right now, that gold coin ain't worth a plug nickel. Yeah. I think you'll find this one's legal tender. Yeah, thanks. How about a sandwich? A what? Uh, a sandwich. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, you're a queer one. <laughs> Here, yeah. wrapped up in this wax paper, a sandwich. Never seen nothing like that before. Yeah. Well, why don't you try one on the house? Eh? I said try one. No charge, yours. Oh, thanks. Good coffee. Yeah, got to admit it is. Folks around here always have a good word to say for Joe Davis and his coffee. Uh, don't you know where you're heading for, stranger? 
No. Haven't the slightest idea. How come? You mean you're just a roaming about with no particular end in mind? No. I've planned what I intend to do for years. Well, what are you intending to do? That I'll discuss with no one. Okay, okay. Don't get the idea I'm nosing into your business. Uh, how's the sandwich? What's that? I said, uh, how's the sandwich? Oh, oh, this. Not so good. Tastes funny. Oh, that's good boiled ham. Don't like it. Hmm. Well, <laughs> you got no kick coming. Didn't have to pay for it. I intend to pay you. Nope. No charge. But I always pay all my debts. Well, this is one you don't have to, stranger. Especially since you don't like the thing. I've paid every debt I ever owed. Except one. Well, one's not so bad. You'll probably get it paid off someday. Well, yeah. I'll pay it. I waited long enough. I can wait a while longer. Want more coffee, stranger? No. Oh, this is plenty. By the way... Do you happen to know many people in these parts? Mm, quite a few, yes. Ever run on to any folks with red hair? Red hair? Yeah. Well, let me think. No. No, can't say the hair. Why? Oh, I'm just interested in folks with red hair. Are you? Only take rides in cars with men with red hair. Why is that? Oh, I got a pretty good reason. You see, the man I owe that debt to has red hair. Ooh, has he? President Red. Hmm. Uh, where are you putting up for the night? Ain't sure. Depends. Well, there's a tourist cabin about two miles up the turnpike. Might stop in there. Place have many customers? Yep, yep, quite a few along this time of year. Better stop there then, have a look around. Mister, if, uh, if you don't mind my saying so, <laughs> you've got me puzzled. And so? Yeah, you sure have. Those, uh, those clothes you're wearing, never seen anything like them before in my life. You probably never will again. What do you mean by that? Oh? Nothing especially. <laughs> You're sure the mysterious one. Uh, you better have another cup of coffee. No, thanks. Well, I'll have a then, huh? No, I'm old-fashioned. I smoke a pipe. Well, okay. Fill her up, then. Uh, say, what kind of tobacco is that? Eh? Hey, oh, it's King's Choice. Never heard of it. No. Reckon you never have. Something new? Older than you were. Mm -hmm. Where can you buy it? Reckon you can't anymore. Oh, quit making it, huh? About a hundred years or so back. Mm hmm? You wouldn't remember. Oh, you're ribbing me, huh? Of course I wouldn't remember a hundred years back. Neither would you. You'd be surprised, mister. What do you mean? Nothing. Especially. I don't get it. Look. You smoking tobacco a hundred years old. Nothing particularly remarkable about that, is there? I always say what's old belongs to the old. I reckon you're not more than 60. <laughs> 60? Sure, 65 at the most. My friend, suppose you take 60, double it and add a century. What? Double 60 and add a hundred? Why, that's... That's 220. Your arithmetic is excellent. Have a match? 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 Oh, yes. Yes, sure, match. Here you be. Thank you. Uh, you have a customer. Oh, yes. Uh, generally, somebody stops for a few gallons of gas long about this time. Better throw away that cigarette around that gasoline. Be back a minute, old timer. Yes, sir. A little gas? No, I'd like a little information. Well, got a lot of that, too. Uh, can you tell me the way to Pine Knob? Pine Knob? What's that, tourist camp? No, it's a town. Pine Knob, Pennsylvania. Never heard of it. 
Uh, it's out this way someplace. It's supposed to be about 80 miles out of Pittsburgh in this direction. Well, see, Pittsburgh's about 78 miles back. Well, then I should be pretty close. Never heard of telling no pine knob. Been living here, man and boy, for 40 years. Ain't never seen nothing of the place or heard tell of it. Well, I know it's out here someplace. I've followed my directions here. I don't know whether to take that crossroad or follow the turnpike. Sorry, can't tell you, mister. Perhaps I can. Eh? <laughs> oh, you. Fine knob, you say, mister? Yes. It's a small town somewhere in this neighborhood. Not in this neighborhood, it ain't. Uh, you don't happen to remember anything about it, do you, old-timer? That's a nice hat, your word. Huh? I said that's a nice hat you're wearing. Uh, yeah, thanks. Did you ever hear of Pine Knob? Mind if I see it? Uh, see what? Your hat. Oh, forget my hat. You know anything about Pine Knob? I might. After I've seen the hat. Look here. If you know how I can get to Pine Knob, I'll... Hey, 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 look, mister. Let him have a gander at the hat. You were the old boy. He, uh, he hasn't got all these marbles. Oh, oh, very well. Uh, here. You can buy it in any hat shop for $10. Free initials if you want them. Yeah. Quite nice. What's that? The hat? Ho, 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 ho. You haven't even looked at it. No. I was admiring the gentleman's hair. What about my hair? I said it's nice. Right. Now, uh, how about the hat back and a little information? Oh. Your initials in the band. K.M. Could the last name be Minor? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Oh, 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 you saw my driver's license on the steering post. No. Well, how'd you know? I just hoped I was right. Oh, hang it all. Do you or don't you know how I can get to Pine Knob? Yes, I know. Will you tell me then? No. I can't do that. Why not? Because the way is seldom traveled. You'd never find it by directions. Then can you go there with me to show me the way? There's nothing I'd like better than to take you to Pine Knob. Oh. Well, now, that's more like it. I'll pay you for whatever your time's worth. I'll collect all right. But I assure you my times are practically no value whatsoever. Uh, come on around, get in. I'll ride in the back. No, uh, come on in front with me. No, thank you. I prefer the back. Say, mister, you better humor the old boy as much as you can. He ain't as bright as he probably used to be. Oh, all right. Uh, all right, old timer, hop in. Oh, uh, thanks a lot. Oh, you're welcome. Come back and see me. Well, I, I see him come and I see him go. But that old gent beats anything I've ever set eyes on. Oh, the old man dropped his bag of tobacco. Hmm. Almost half full. King's choice. The smoker's friend. Raymond Tobacco Company. Established 1756. We leave the turnpike in a minute or two. Uh, then how far? Not far. Hmm. The road good? Not so good. I say, does my chatter bore you, old-timer? Oh, not especially. Uh, you give me the impression you don't want to talk. People talk too much nowadays. Me, I like to talk. Especially when I'm driving. Helps make the miles go faster. The turn up ahead. Yeah, where? Off to the right. Well, there's no place to turn off. Yes, there is. You'll see it. There. See? Well, Yes. Well, that, that road, it, it wasn't there a moment ago. It's been there for years. It's the road to take. <sighs> this isn't any ordinary road. Right. It isn't. No automobile tracks. 
Never been an automobile on this road. I, I don't understand. You will, presently. And a stagecoach. Stagecoach? Yes. You can see the hoof marks in the soft earth. Oh, I was noticing. Six coal black horses, the pride of Pennsylvania. What's that? Nothing important. I see. Look behind. Behind? Yes. Look, where's the turnpike? We have left it. Far behind. No, not far. Less than a half a mile. We should be able to see it from here. No. It's nowhere in view. The buildings along the turnpike, where are they? All of that is past. Past? Yes. There is no turnpike. There are no buildings. Nothing but open prairie land. Trees. Hills. Tall grass. No fences, no other roads except this one. It's the only road for miles around. But where does it take us? To Pine Knob. That's where you wanted to go? Well, yes, but I... You asked me to show you the way to Pine Knob. This is it. Well, everything's changed so. Suddenly, everything's different. Yes, naturally. But why? Did you ever ask yourself what time really is? Time? Yes, Mr. Miner. Time. I don't follow you. Suppose a long time ago something had happened to you. Suppose that incident was so important, so outstanding in your life, it was necessary for you to do something about it. I still don't understand. Let me put it into the present instead of the past. Suppose today something should happen to you. Suppose it is so out of the ordinary that you'd never forget it. Probably something you think needs revenge. Revenge? And suppose you decided your spirit would never rest until you'd found that revenge. Even though many scores of years had passed away. Well, I, I don't understand. Well, what would you do, Mr. Miner? What could you do but roam from place to place seeking that revenge? You're talking over my head. Am I? You certainly are. What I'm getting at is this. If you'd find yourself in just such a situation... Time would suddenly have no meaning to you. you think no more about the past or the present or the future. Time would be something unknown to you. Things you call the future now wouldn't be future at all. Incidents you call past wouldn't be past. They'd be now, what you call present, all rolled up into one. Uh, that's a strange way of reasoning. Not so strange once you've experienced it. Have you ever experienced it? I assure you, yes. You mean that the things that have happened in the past are actually happening now? Precisely. And things in the future are taking place now, too? Naturally. One case being possible, the other naturally follows. Oh, oh, it's just some philosopher's theory. It's much more than a mere theory. Oh, you know better than that, and so do I. What's happened in the past has happened. What's going to happen certainly isn't taking place now. Possibly I'll change your mind about that before this day ends. <laughs> oh, oh, no. Uh, not me, mister. By the way, you haven't told me your name. Names are unimportant. Only incidents are important. Yeah. And you haven't said how you knew my name. That was quite obvious. Your red hair. The initials in your hat band. I still don't see how you There's knew. There's Pine Knob ahead. Yeah. Down in the valley. Yeah. 
Where did it get its name, Pine Knob? Because in the center of the town you'll find a little mound with three pine trees growing from it. It was under these trees that men have been trying for their lives. It's from them that men have been hanged. Hmm. That's a pleasant thought. The town seems deserted. Yes, I suppose it is by now. What do you mean? You'll see. There. Stage office is over there. And the stage is in. See? Across the road. Pull up here. Across from it. Yeah, right. So this is Pine Knob. I see. That man on the stagecoach with the reins in his hands. And that other man handing up that metal box. Right. Listen to what they say. All right, Hank. That's a gold. You better take good care of it. You know where they're going to get this gold. It's going right on through to Kelby. If anybody tries to stop the stage this trip, I'll be ready for him. Pass along, partner. See you in a week. Come on, boy. Get up there. Gee, get up. <laughs> Those two men. The one on the stagecoach. Exactly. He, he looks and talks exactly like you, and the other one like me. We must follow that stage. Start the car. I, I don't understand all this. Start the car. Follow the stage. I'd take my oath, but those two men are exactly... It's time to talk. Follow the stage. Oh, what is this, a dream? Oh, no. I waited a long time for this day. What do you mean? Yes. Nine score years I waited. Nine score? More than three normal lifetimes. And finally, the day is here. Look here. Whoever you are, would you mind telling me just what this is all about? Why are we following that stagecoach? Yeah. See? It's beginning. What's beginning? The stage. See? It stopped. Yeah. Something's wrong. More than you think. Drive right up behind it. Maybe we can help. No, there's nothing we can do. Stop right behind the stage. Yeah. Hey, look. Look at that man standing at the side of the stagecoach, talking to the driver. I'm watching. He's the man with the red hair. The man who looks exactly like me. And the other one on the stage, he's the exact image of you. Quiet. Watch what happens. Listen. What's up, partner? Called me out of town, did you? Yeah. I sure did, Hank. I reckon I'd better take that gold. Take the gold? Where? Just take it. Hand it down, Hank. Hold on, hold on. Questions. Just hand down the box. I don't think I'd better, Ken. Now look, I mean business. You... You drawing a gun on me, partner? I mean business, Hank. Hand down that gold. You're... You're robbing this gold. I'm taking it and clearing out. Here tell folks is settling out west. I aim to go there. Ken. I done trusted you like a brother. I never thought the day'd come when you... Hand me down the gold, Hank. This gold's going to kill me. It ain't going no farther than it is right now. I'm taking it with me. Put away your gun, Ken. Don't argue with me, Hank. I'll shoot you if I have to. And by Virginia, you'll have to. I ain't handed down this gold. Keep those hands on the reins. Not on our life, partner. Don't go for that gun. You... You shot me. In cold blood? No. No. I... I, I didn't have it. You knew I didn't carry a gun. Just the rifle there on the seat. No, I didn't do that. I didn't shoot you. I wasn't going for no gun. You've murdered me. No, for heaven's sakes, this isn't real. I've never fired a gun in my life. You think it isn't real? No. Well, it can't be. Now, 
Do you understand what I meant by no past, no future? That man on the stage, you. One hundred and eighty years ago on this spot. But it can't be you. That man on the stage was shot. He fell. He's lying there on the ground now. Is he? Turn around. See for yourself. Gone. Everything's gone. Everything but you and me. I didn't kill you. That man with the red hair. The one who spoke like you, looked like you, was the first member of your family to settle in this country. He was my partner. I trusted him. He murdered me. But I... I didn't... Now, the debt is about to be paid. No. No, you can't blame me for something that happened almost 200 years ago. I waited this long for my revenge. I won't let it pass by now. Get into the car. No. No, keep away. Don't come near me. Don't touch that wheel. Time has come. I'm driving now. No, no, I say. There's no no way to escape. You can't murder me. I had nothing to do with that shooting. You can't escape. I will escape. I will, I will. You're doomed. I knew you were some devil. You brought me here to kill me. But you can't, you can't, you can't. The road ends around the turn up there. Nothing but a thousand foot drop down the mountainside. Pennsylvania Turnpike. Tonight's original tale of dark fantasy by Scott Bishop, originating in the studios of WKY. Ben Morris played Ken Minor. Fred Wayne was heard as Hank, and Muir Height was the filling station attendant. Next Friday night at the same time, listen to the 19th in this series of unusual and original tales of dark fantasy, created by Scott Bishop. Next week's story is called Convoy for Atlantis, a fantastic yarn of ships that disappear, disappear in the night, and of strange and valuable treasures which arise from the sea. An adventure that takes us down to the very bottom of the mighty Atlantic Ocean for a special observation of The Convoy for Atlantis. Don't miss this weird tale of an ancient race that lives again on a mighty sunken continent. Tom Paxton speaking. Dark Fantasy comes to you from Oklahoma City. This is the National Broadcasting Company.